And so this morning we also have a new song for you and it just unveils our testimony in the bridge. I love it, it that he pulled us out of the pit, paid for all of our sins, rescued us from the grave. And of course he deserves all the glory. So this song is called, This Is Our God. And it is us singing and declaring who he is and what he's done. So join in and listen to the lyrics and just be blessed. Here we go.
front of me and two crosses in front of you, but you guys can stare at that one. I'll stare at this one. And this is really what it's all about today, isn't it? Everything we do is centered around the cross of Jesus Christ and his empty tomb. We know without a doubt that he died for each and every one of our sins. And we know without a doubt that he rose from that dead. And so today we worship him because of that. We worship him in spirit and truth. And uh, just a little praise report uh, for me personally, my, my nephew is getting baptized today. And so he's gonna be experiencing the newness of life, little baby Ben. And so, uh, man, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Um, all right, with that being said, let's stand up. Let's share a name, shake a hand, let someone know. It's good to be worshiping alongside of you, Morgan. Good to be worshiping alongside of you. watching online, we're so glad to be uh, worshiping alongside of you. Uh, go ahead and write your name in the, in the chat. Let someone know that you're there and how we can be praying for you. If you ever need someone to pray for you or pray with you, if you need someone to come and bring you communion, uh, you can always uh, send us an email. You can email Pastor Mark at pastormarkspldecator.org. You can email myself at Pastor Bill at spldecator. We would love to have you here. begin today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Almighty God, be in this place. Fill our hearts and our lives with your worship. Lord, we pray that you would not allow us to leave here unchanged, but use this time to mold us and shape us into who you long for us to be. Lord, we give this time over to you. In your mighty and precious name, amen. Well, today I just wanted to share the scripture from day nine of the Forgiving Challenge. I hope everyone, ha have you been blessed by the Forgiving Challenge? Amen, yes, yes. Well, I just wanted to share that scripture that, um, that they just kind of ask us to memorize. Now I must confess, I'm still working on getting it memorized completely, but I'm just so thankful that that keeps us in his word when we're trying to memorize his word. It keeps us coming back and finding out even more new things. And so I just wanted to share 2 Corinthians 12, 9, which says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Ooh, this girl is weak. <laughs> and I love that. Therefore, scripture says, I can boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. So today, as we enter into the topic of confession, May we rejoice in the work that God is doing in and through us. May his power rest on us this morning. And I just encourage us as we start in worship, focus on God's holiness. And that is grace is sufficient. See, while yes, we are sinners, it is when we understand God's holiness and the gift of his grace, that we will be gladly compelled to confess, knowing that we leave sin at the foot of the cross and we gain freedom in Christ. When we focus on his holiness, we do, we see our weakness and we are moved to confess our sin. We receive his grace and we feel his power resting on us. So take these songs as we worship and ask the Lord to reveal his holiness this morning. We are here for you, Jesus. Will you meet us here today?
Pastor Bill. Okay. Hey, 
new members, this is your time where you stand up and you come forward. And while they're doing that, yeah. Uh, we're just so excited. Uh, they've traveled through five weeks with us and uh, excited to have them be a part of our family of faith. They said, yes, uh, I want to call this place home. I want to be part of this family of faith. And uh, so we're just so excited to welcome you all uh, to be a part of our family of faith, to invite you in. Uh, we pray that you continue to find this to be a place where you can belong, where you can grow, and where you can be a part of what God is seeking to do through this place here and beyond into our community. Uh, one of the things that we talked about in our weeks together is uh, what it means to be a member, right? And uh, I gave the analogy that for me, it's kind of thinking about how uh, you can be a friend of the family versus being part of the family, right? That you can be a friend of the family and uh, hang out with the family, enjoy the good parts of being part of that family. You can even sometimes, if you're a friend of the family, a good friend, you get to go on vacation with the family and all those fun things. But there's a different thing when you become part of the family, right? That's saying, I want to be an active part of this, right? I want to invest. I want to give something too, right? That there's some responsibility that comes with being part of the family. And that's true for all of us as members, right? As a body of believers here at St. Paul's, you're not just here to be an observer and a receiver of the good things of God, but as a member, you've said, yes, I want to be an active part of this family. I want to invest I want to be a part of what God is doing in this place. I understand there's some responsibility that comes with that, but that's what it means to be a member in this place. And I think that's a good thing for us all to reflect on here today. Am I doing that, right? Am I actively being involved in this family, even as I find this as a place to belong and to be loved? And so I hope that for you guys, that that is what you find and that you find those places to plug in, to use the gifts that God has given you. Uh, I look forward to the many years ahead with you all doing life in ministry together. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to introduce them here. So Chase and Lindsay Wilson uh, joining us here. Yeah, you can clap. Thank you. Uh, we have Kyle and Donna May and their kids, Lucas and Marissa. We have the Stauffer family, Dave and Cynthia and Michael, and then Alyssa is also their daughter. So here after service today, uh, we're going to have an opportunity, uh, some cookies at the coffee bar out here. So please stop by, say hello, welcome them to the family, uh, and uh, let's just take a moment to pray over them. So uh, put your hand out. Lord God, I just thank you and I praise you. Uh, for these people, uh, the ways you've worked in their lives, the ways you've drawn them to yourself. And I thank you that you've brought them here to our family of faith. Uh, what an honor and a privilege it is to have them join with us and to be a part of doing life and ministry together. Uh, Lord, continue to grow them deeper in their faith and their trust in you. May this be a place where they're fed and grown and challenged and uh, a place for them to belong, a place where they know they're loved, a place where they find uh, encouragement and yet also loving accountability and all of those things that goes into the beauty of being a part of your church. And uh, Lord, may you help them to find the places where they can uh, use their gifts and talents, the unique experiences you've given them to serve others and to be a part of what you're doing to seek and save the lost uh, in this community. So Lord, bless them. And uh, we just thank you for them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give uh, one more big round of applause. And you all can go back to your seats. Awesome. Well, let's go before our Lord in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you are good. And we thank you uh, for the gift of life. Um, Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in this church. And Almighty God, we pray that you would continue to do work. God, we can't do this thing without you. We would ruin it. But Lord, in you, you bring life and hope into this place. God, we thank you for the life and the hope that you're bringing into this upwards basketball and, and cheer season. Lord, we pray that you would use this 
this time to pour your love and your grace and your mercy into each and every person's life. God, we pray for those who have not yet been baptized to to hear the Holy Spirit stirring in them, to take that bold step of faith. And God, we do thank you for baby Ben who is getting baptized today. We pray that you would raise him up to be a man after your own heart. God, I pray that you would do mighty things through him and in him. And God, right now we pray for healing for those who are hurting. We pray for Lori and Michelle and Mike and Tanya. Wesley, Lila, and Sharon, Darla, and Della, and Pam, and Gordon, and Lord, we pray that you'd bring healing to them. And God, while we celebrate everything that you're doing, we, or we mourn together too, Lord. Uh, we mourn the loss of Tom Wilson in our lives who went to be with you. And Lord, we pray that the family and friends of Tom would would look to you, they would find hope in you, that you would surround them with your comfort and your grace and your mercy. God, you are doing incredible things. And so we lift up uh, this week as we celebrate Lutheran Schools Week, we do pray for Unity Christian and we pray for the Early Learning Center, Lord. We, we thank you that you have placed both of these organizations and the lives of our church. And we pray that you would continue to use both of them in a mighty way. God, we lift up all these things to you. Knowing that you are good, we are bold to pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh, well, we are about to enter into this time where we are going to be receiving the very body and blood of Jesus. And um, there are typically four questions we ask the, the sixth graders as they prepare for this meal. Um, and the, the first one is this, do you believe that you are a sinner? And your answer would be? Yes. yes. We are all sinful. And said, in, in fact, scripture says if we say we're without sin, we're just deceiving ourselves and the truth isn't in us. We believe that in this bread and wine, there is the very real presence, the body and blood of Jesus. Do you believe that the body and blood of Jesus is in, with, and under the bread and wine? And we would say yes. We also ask the question, do we believe that Jesus gives the forgiveness to us through this? Is this your confession? Yes. Yes. Good. Well, know this. That Jesus does bring forgiveness in your life. He is working and moving. And because of the life and death and resurrection of our King Jesus, your sins are forgiven. They're gone, taken away. They're no longer yours. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Welcome, friends, to the Lord's table.
true body and blood of our Savior Jesus may it strengthen you, preserve you keep you strong in the faith to life everlasting, go in his joy and in his peace Amen Amen. Holy, holy, holy I love that, thanks for singing Morgan All right. well it's time for announcements, you ready for this? Here we go, we got uh, the family Easter egg hunt and the, uh, the, East, uh, the family Easter event that's happening March 23rd. Everyone say March 23rd. N- nice. So good. That's happening from 10 to 12. You can check out more about that in your bulletins. Um, all right. Unity Christian. Everyone say Unity Christian. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot happening. We've got Lutheran Schools Week this week, and that's going to be a big thing. They're going to be collecting uh, stuff to hand out to the homeless in our community. And so if you have anything that you'd like to give to that, um, they'll be collecting stuff in the fellowship area. Um, You can also leave scriptures and notes of encouragement for them for the upcoming prayer walk. And May 3rd, it's happening, the dinner auction. We're going to have a red and black gala Um, on Friday, May 3rd, and we would love for you to be a part of that. In addition to all of those things, um, Unity has sent us a letter that they asked to read to you all, just a letter of appreciation and care. Um, You know, they're one of our biggest ministries that we play a role in, and so um, they're just wanting to say thank you. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to read it, and then uh, that'll be that. All right, they say, good morning. Uh, This week, Unity Christian School, which is a ministry of the Lutheran School Association, will be celebrating Lutheran Schools Week. Some of our teachers have planned many wonderful things for the students, and we are excited to celebrate and recognize how blessed we are to be a part of Lutheran education. There's a service project planned for the week, and we'll be collecting items to help with the homelessness. And feel free to reach out to any Unity teacher, staff member, or student for more information on ways you can donate. With all that being said, the ministry we do would not be possible without you. 
our church congregations, our pastors, our DCEs, and those who support our school, and we want to say thank you. Whether it's financially or spiritually or both, thank you for the many ways you support all of us. It does not go unnoticed, and we're incredibly grateful and blessed to be able to do ministry together. Please continue to pray and support our school as we need the support more than ever. We know that God is faithful and he will provide. That's an amen. He will. Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thank you again for all you do for us, and may God bless you for your kindness and generosity, the staff and students of Unity Christian. So that's a, that's a nice little, little thank you note. If you guys want to send like a thank you note back or like a, like a hey, you know, and any, any way you want to pray for the teachers, let me know, and I'll, I'll give them your cards. Okay? All right? That's all I got. We got Miss Erica coming up for Kids Work. Here I am. All right, guys. So actually, kids, you guys can stay out there, but I need you to turn to your parents. I need you to say, are you listening? Parents, are you listening? Grandparents, everybody else? Okay, great. Soon we'll be back up on the screen. We're just waiting on that soundboard. But I have a kid's word for you today. Raise your hand if you have ever made a mistake and tried to cover it up. You didn't want to admit that you had done something wrong. Anybody out there ever done that? Well, kids, I'm going to tell you a story today about a time that I made a big mistake. When I was 10 years old, it was Easter time. Is it about to be Easter time? Yes, it is. And every Easter, my mom would take me and my sister shopping, and we would pick out a new Easter dress and new Easter shoes to wear. And I would always get so excited. Well, we got our new Easter dress, and we got our new shoes, and I got these brand new white kids that looked like this. They were brand new. They were white as could be. Nothing was on them. And my mom said, Erica, I just have one rule. Can you wait to wear these shoes and your dress until Easter so that they look really nice? I was like, Mom, I'm 10. What do you think I am? I'm not going to mess up my shoes. What do you think I did? Uh, I just couldn't help it. Me and my sister were at home playing, and it was spring break, and I put on my dress, and I put on my shoes, and we were just dancing around, and then we decided to go outside. And it was an April Easter, which means there was a lot of rain, which means a lot of puddles, which means a lot of mud. And so I was out splashing with my sister and playing, and we came in, and my sister, her name is Karina, she said, Erica, look at your shoes! And I looked down, and they looked like this. Do you think my mom was going to notice? But I was determined to try and get them back to white. So me and my sister went into the bathroom and we filled up the tub and we were scrubbing it with my toothbrush and toothpaste and we were trying so hard to get it back to nice, pure white. We did our best. It didn't go back the way it was, but I thought, my mom won't notice. Moms don't notice things, right? So I put the shoes back and I went about my day and my mom didn't say anything all day. She didn't say anything until we were getting ready for bed and we were laying in bed. She said, Erica, is there anything you want to admit to me today? She knows. She knows. And I said, Mom, yes. I took the shoes out and I got them all muddy. And she said, well, Erica, you know, I didn't even see the shoes, but I saw this all throughout my house. And she said, I saw the tub and it's full of dirt and mud. I had tried really hard to cover up my sin, and sometimes we do that. We try to fix our sin ourselves, and even if we try to cover it up, we oftentimes leave a mess behind. But what it does it mean to confess? Confess means admitting to something, or it actually means to agree that we have done something wrong. Once I told my mom what I had done, she forgave me. She wasn't mad at me anymore. She was a little disappointed that I hadn't listened in the first place, but she accepted that I had done something wrong and forgiven me. And that's what we're learning about today. In church, we say, and it says in 1 John, that if we say we have never sinned, we're lying. But if we confess our sin to Jesus, he is always faithful and will always forgive us. So today, I want you to think about if there's a sin you're holding on to, the best thing for you to do is to give that to Jesus and he'll forgive you every single time. 
and don't hide things from your mom. Amen. My mic's. Oh, and SPL Littles, if you're four to six, Miss Coley's in the back with her sign. You guys can head on back there for your Littles time. Well, thank you, Miss Erica. We are, uh, just love how awesome of a job you do with that and just the ways you take these sometimes challenging concepts and then make them tangible, not just for the kids, but for all of us. So thank you. Uh, we've been going through this forgiving challenge, right, in this time of Lent, uh, the six-week period where we prepare our hearts. It's usually a time of contemplation. We prepare our hearts for uh, Holy Week, right? and for the death of Jesus, and then looking forward to Easter. And so as we're going through these 40 days, uh, we've been doing this forgiving challenge, seeking to find a greater level, experience a greater level of freedom in Jesus than we have before, right? To be ushered into that amazing and abundant freedom that we have in Jesus, our Savior. And last week, Pastor Rob uh, started us into kind of the first letter of this acronym SCARS that we're using uh, to help us in this journey toward freedom in Jesus. And that first part is that S was sin, right? Recognizing that we sin and we uh, define sin, that word sin, it comes from this idea of archery, right? Which is missing the mark. And so whether you miss the mark by a little or a lot, that's still sin, and no matter whether you sin a little or sin a lot, your, big, your sin is you, you think is big or it's a little one, all sin separates us from God and it needs to be dealt with, right? And so the first step is just recognizing that each and every one of us, that I am a sinner, I sin each and every day. And one of the things I want to come back to from last week is this, uh, this phrase. And if you've been following along with us, which I hope you have in these uh, with the daily devotions uh, for our forgiving challenge. You've seen this in there as well. But the admission price into freedom begins with an admission of your sin. It's the idea that if you are going to enter into the freedom that God has for you, if you're going to truly grasp that and live in that freedom, it's got to start with admitting your sin. And that's what today is all about. That's what confession is, right? Confession is an admission of my sin. As Miss Erica said, it's agreeing with God. Yes, I am a sinner and I have sinned. This is what I have done wrong, Lord. It's getting that over and handing that over to God. She referenced this passage from 1 John chapter 1, right? Where John writes, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves. We're lying, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. John lays it out. He says, listen, all of you are sinners. You all have sinned. All of us sin. But what matters is what you do after you sin." Right? And his invitation, God's invitation to each of us is to come to him that we might receive forgiveness and freedom in him, as John says. But you know, all too often, what we actually do after our sin and why we remain trapped and not experiencing the freedom that God has for us is that we try to deal with sin on our own, right? We, we sin and then we try to clean up the mess ourselves. And there's a lot of different ways that we do this. One is we can outright deny it, right? Like, no, I'm not a sinner. No, I didn't sin. No, I didn't do that, right? It's like that kid that gets caught red-handed and mom asks him like, hey, did you do? Nope, nope, I didn't do that. Well, I saw you. Nope, I, I didn't do it, right? We can do that. As adults, we still find ways to just outright deny our sin. But maybe we don't outright deny it. The other thing we like to do is minimize it. And this is 
prevalent throughout our world today, right? That we, we begin to say, oh, that's not really wrong or that's not that bad. Hey, everyone else is doing it, right? That's our best gauge for morality is, well, if everybody else is doing it, if others are doing it, I guess it's not so wrong. Or I've only done it once or whatever it might be. We try to minimize our sin. We try to say, oh, it's not a big deal. And another kind of nuanced version of this, I think, is sometimes we don't just say, oh, it's not a big deal. But what we do, we try to minimize our sin by pointing out other people's sin. Like, hey, did you see what Sally did over there? Did you hear that, right? By looking at other people's sin, well, at least I'm not that big of a sinner. At least I didn't. Or I think of, and I'm going to tell on myself of many times the conflicts or arguments between my wife and myself, uh, where she'll say some, point out something that I'm honestly doing wrong, and my natural reaction is to say, well, but you did that, you know, just the other day, and you do that too, or you did this, right? I I try to point out somebody else's sin to try to minimize my own sin. Maybe we blame others, right? That we say, well, I only did this because you did blank, right? That somehow because somebody else did something first, now I'm off scot-free, that my sin, it doesn't matter, it's justified somehow, and we blame others for our own wrongs, right? We blame uh, organizations or institutions or whatever, all kinds of people we look to blame, and this goes all the way back to the garden, right? What's the first thing Adam and Eve did when they uh, ate of the fruit? God comes and says, hey, did you guys eat of the tree? Adam says, It was her. She made me do it. And you, God, you're the one that gave her to me, right? And Eve goes on and blames. Sometimes we try to just cover it up, right? We think if nobody else knows, then maybe it really doesn't count against me. Maybe if I just keep it secret, if I just keep it to myself, maybe even God won't find out. Oh, we know God knows our heart. God knows it all, right? We can't cover up our sin. That doesn't work. And one that I didn't put up here, but I thought of later is another way we try to deal with our sin is we just try to try harder, right? Like I, I know that I did wrong. I'll admit that. But I think if I can do enough good or if I can do better in the future, that somehow that covers over that sin in the past. Maybe if I do enough good, God will just accept me, right? I'll just be good enough for him, But the trouble is that our trying harder doesn't get us to being better. Our trying harder, we find that we continue to sin and to fall short again and again. And here is the problem with dealing with sin on our own. That as long as we try to deal with sin on our own, we remain captive to sin. Imprisoned, shackled. The guilt and the shame, they weigh on us because deep down, as much as we might try to deny it or minimize it or blame others or cover it up, deep down, you and I, we all know that we've sinned. We know those sins, that guilt and that shame remains. I love what uh, the psalmist David says in Psalm 32. He says, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away. I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. David says, listen, when I was trying to deal with sin on my own, it stole life away from me. I was wasting away, but it was only when I brought my my sin, my guilt and my shame to God and to Jesus, that's the moment when I was set free. And that's what confession is all about. That's why this is such a pivotal piece of this journey to freedom, because without confession, I cannot enter in to the freedom that God has for me. Until I get to that place where I bring my sin to Jesus, I will remain captive. This is why each and every week we try to have confession as part of our service, because we believe it's such an important thing. 
that frees us and helps us come into the love and grace of our God. And while that is good, and I think it's beautiful how at times we have these written confessions that really can speak when we may not have the words or know how to start, it's sometimes I think these formal confessions, uh, we get into this rut where we confess that we're a sinner without confessing our sin. Do you know what I mean by that? Right, where I can confess vaguely, like, yes, I know I'm a sinner, but I don't really get to the heart of, here is my sin. Like, this is the specific sin. This is the things I've done. And not that I have to enumerate them all, but there is something about getting to that specificity, right? That draws us greater into that freedom. Or maybe with confession, we have this idea that confession, and maybe what holds us back from it, is that we think it's this thing that's just going to make us feel worse, right? Like when you go and have to confess in a courtroom or you're coming to confess to your parent when you did something and they had that, just that guilty feeling, that weight on you, right? But confession isn't meant to leave you in that place. It is good for us to have sorrow for our sins. But confession is meant to lead us into the forgiveness and life, the freedom that God has for us. It's not meant to condemn you further. It's meant to free you from that sin. You know, we've been traveling along, or at least we started last week, looking at Peter's story, the disciple Peter's story, and and uh, his life, and really going into his kind of greatest known sin of denying Jesus. And if you remember, uh, Peter, he was bold, full of, uh, always was quick to speak, and uh, before Jesus went to the cross, he boldly, boldly declared, he said, Jesus, I even if all these other people go away and they deny you and they fall away, I won't. I'll even go to death before I deny you. And as much as he desired to not fall into sin, he still fell into sin, right? He denied him not once, not twice, but three times. And we heard in Luke this, that as that third time happened, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying the Lord had said, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. I love this account from Luke because it includes the part where Jesus looks at Peter. And I just can, I've I've had that moment before where someone I love, when I know I'm caught in sin, looks at me and just the, ugh, the gut punch that happens because of that. And uh, I can only imagine in those days after Jesus died, the, the weight that rested on Peter's shoulders. How many times I bet that he ran over and over and over in his mind that scenario, wishing he could go back and do something different, wishing that he could change it all, wish, thinking that he would never have an opportunity to make things right, to go and speak to his Lord and say, Jesus, I'm sorry I wanted to, but I couldn't. I didn't. Lord, I fell short in thinking that he would never have that opportunity. I can imagine the the crushing weight of that sin. And that's what makes uh, three days later, we know that God had a different story in mind, right? That Jesus rose from the dead. And in, in Mark chapter 16, there's this beautiful thing that's included there in the resurrection account from Mark. Whereas the women go to the tomb and they're met by the angel, the angel says to them, go tell the disciples and Peter. That Jesus, or the angel tells them to tell Peter. That Peter by name is to know that Jesus has risen from the dead, that the story's not over. There's still an opportunity. There's a fresh start ahead if he wants it. And we see, you know, that God, Jesus appeared to the disciples himself. And then there's a third t- account that we have in John chapter 21. And I'm going to invite you to turn there now. John chapter 21. Jesus appears to his disciples again by the Sea of Tiberias. And uh, he revealed himself in this way. So Jesus appears to the disciples. He tells them, hey, I'm risen from the dead. They know that this great thing has happened. And then they're in this time of waiting. We don't know how much time has passed before this happens, but 
they're, they're together and they're in this time of waiting. Uh, Peter, I would guess, because he's a man of action, as we've seen, isn't so good with waiting. And so we see Simon and Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples were all together. And Simon, tired of waiting, he says, I'm going to go fishing, right? I'm going back to what I, I knew. I'm going to go fishing. I know that at least. Even if I failed as a disciple, at least I know I can go fishing. I know how to do that. And the rest of them, they say, okay, we'll go with you. And they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. So one interesting thing, right? I don't know about these disciples if they're really that good of fishermen, because all the accounts in the Bible of them catching fish on their own, they catch nothing, right? It's only when Jesus steps in that they get a fish. Uh, but also something that struck me this week, and you don't see this in all translations, but uh, Jesus, uh, how he addresses them, he calls them children. And I looked this up, it's not just like a child, like a teenager even, like this is, he uses the word that is for small child, like under seven. And I don't know, maybe this was just kind of one of those ways that Jesus had addressed them regularly so they knew that, but I, I began to wonder if why he addressed them as children is because he's saying, listen, you guys are acting like children. I mean, I've done this great thing. I have great things in store for you. And what are you doing? You're just going back to what you, what you always knew, right? You're just going back to the things you're comfortable with. Come on, children. Let's go. There's something more for you. Who knows? I don't know why he does it, but just an interesting side note. So uh, going on here, as Jesus says, they say, no, Jesus says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. You would think things would start clicking in their minds like, wait, this has happened before, right? So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, uh, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. Man, Peter was eager to get to Jesus. I mean, you don't usually put clothes on to jump into water, right? And so he, I don't know, he takes this clothes, puts his clothes on, and he says he threw himself, right? It's not like even a pretty dive. He just throws himself into the sea, and they weren't even that far from shore, right? It was 100 yards, so, but Peter was just so anxious to get to, to Jesus. And I don't know, maybe it was he wanted to show Jesus, like, Jesus, I still love you. I want to be in your presence. Jesus, I care about you even though I denied you. I don't know what it is, but Peter wanted to get there. And when he gets there and when the disciples get there, Jesus is making breakfast and he invites them to bring more fish. And he says, let's eat. And this is an important thing, a significant invitation from Jesus. Because you see, to eat a meal with someone in that day was a sign of acceptance. It was a sign of intimate relationship, of fellowship. That's why the religious leaders of that day were always losing their minds when Jesus ate with people they considered sinners, right? It's why they called him out on it. They were freaking out because you weren't supposed to eat with those kind of people. That was to show acceptance and, and relationship with them. And they're unclean. You can't have relationship with them until they clean their act up. And so here in this moment, this invitation to breakfast is a gesture of forgiveness from Jesus to Peter. It's an invitation into his presence, into his forgiveness, into his love. But Jesus doesn't stop there. And I think it goes back here to what I said earlier. It's one thing to 
to hear generally you're forgiven, right? For all of that sin out there, but it's another thing to be brought to the place of a specific sin and to hear this specific sin, this is forgiven. And so after this meal, after this breakfast, Jesus brings Peter to this specific place Not to condemn Peter, not to heap on the shame and the guilt, but he knew Peter needed this to be fully free. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. And he said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved this time because the Lord asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Why did Jesus ask him three times, do you love me? Because he denied Jesus three times. Jesus brought him face to face with his sin, so that he could bring him into the freedom, the fullness of freedom that he had for him. He brought Peter to this place where he couldn't avoid it. He had to come to this place. But in this, in his gesture, his invitation of tend my sheep, feed my sheep, it's an invitation to, to still be in his presence and not even more, or even more than that, right? It's a, a call to a greater purpose. I want you to be a part of what I'm seeking to do, Peter. It's forgiven. Come, s- step into this great purpose that I have for you. But you know, something interesting here is that we don't see any kind of formal confession from Peter, right? Like we think about that, right? When my sons do something wrong, I'm said, hey, you got to go make it right, which means go and say, I'm sorry, right? Or forgive me. And, and then the other one says, I forgive you back. And we don't see that from Peter. And who knows, maybe there was other interactions where he said that. But I, I wonder, I wonder if that's because of this. That Jesus knows our heart. And so it's not about how you come to Jesus. It's not about having all the right words in that confession or even having the words to say, but it's just that you come to him. Right? It's just that you come to him with that sin, that you lay it before him, even if you don't have all the right words, because God knows your heart and he's ready to hear your confession. Just speak. What if you just come to God with your heart? laying before him the reality of your sin, admitting and agreeing with him, yes, I've sinned. Here it is, Lord. Here's my sin. Help me to receive your freedom. I want that freedom, Lord. I want to be free from the guilt and the shame. This is Jesus' invitation to you. Come. Just come that you might be set free. And so, friends, here today, We're going to heed that invitation. We're not just going to hear it and say, yeah, that sounds good, Pastor Mark. Uh Uh-huh. I'm not going to let you just walk out of here like that. Here and now, we're going to have an opportunity to bring our sin to Jesus and to lay it at the foot of his cross, to leave it there with him that we might experience freedom in a greater way. So, If you look at the pews, at the end of the pews, there's these cards. They're blank cards. If you're at the end of the pew, take one and pass it down your row. If there's not enough for your row, you can grab one of the first time guest cards in your pews and write on the back of that. But what I want you to do, and no peeking at each other, don't look at other people's papers as they're writing, but take this time, this is an op, an opportunity for you to honestly confess to Jesus. Maybe it's a sin that's been weighing on you for a long time. Maybe it's something that just happened this week. Whatever it is, take some time, reflect, pray. And if you need some help, you know, this last week, if you've been following along with us, there was this sin test in the devotions. 
And it was some heavy stuff, some deep stuff there, right? But unless we get down to the deep stuff, we're not gonna find that freedom, friends. And so maybe it's some of these things that were on that list. Some of those questions that brings a sin to your mind that when you think about it, you realize you've still been carrying around that guilt and shame. Whatever it is, take a moment now, write it down that you might bring it to Jesus and leave it at his feet, that you might walk out of here today with greater freedom than you've had in a while. So take a moment. So here's what we're gonna do. Morgan's gonna go into singing a song here for us. And while she's doing that, as you're ready, you can fold that paper in half once you have that confession done. I would invite you to bring it up here and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Lay it at the feet, foot of the cross. Lay down that sin, stop carrying that burden, hand it over to Jesus that you might receive his forgiveness, his freedom, his love.
life, you have laid your sin at the feet of Jesus. You've laid it at his cross. It is no longer yours to carry. You are free in Jesus, free from that sin. Don't take it up again. Live in that freedom. And I hope you have found freedom in a greater way here today, but I hope you found something else. Did you see all the people coming up here to lay down their sin at the foot of the cross? You're not alone in your sin. If you thought this was a place full of perfect people, it's not. I'm here, okay? It's not. And if you thought that because of your sin, this is a place that you weren't welcome, you are. And if you thought your sin was too big for God to forgive, it's not. You are welcome in the presence of our God. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are set free. Friends, it's not about how you come to Jesus. It's just that you come. So come. Experience the freedom he has for you. Amen? Let's stand and sing. Lord, we just thank you. God, you make all the difference. When you call us out of shame and brokenness, sin and confusion, failure, oh, we run out of that grave. So Lord, as we sing glorious day, thank you for freedom today. Thank you for resurrecting life today. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name.
That is it sure does. Yes. Hey. Oh, well, receive this blessing, friends. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his unending peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, go in peace. Serve the Lord.